Welcome to our sixth and final online production on the life and legacy of Oscar Wilde. To those of you returning, thank you very much. Those of you visiting us for the first time, you are very welcome. I'm Christine Keneally, Director of Ireland's Great Hunger Institute at Quinnipiac University. In last week's programme, we focused on the final decades of Oscar's life. Paradoxically, his most successful and his most tragic years. We ended with Oscar's premature death in 1900. Today, our focus is on Oscar's many enduring gifts to us. So welcome to Still Wild, the legacies of Oscar Wilde, from fallen hero to cultural icon. Today, we will be welcoming a very special guest, Peter Samuelson, a Hollywood-based producer who has a unique connection to Oscar, but more on Peter later. We also have lined up three brilliant actors who have become very special friends of Oscar online. Firstly, Rachel Pickup. Joining us from London, Rachel? Hi. Yes, hi, you're very welcome. Rachel works in London and New York, on Broadway, off Broadway, in the West End and off the West End, as well as in many leading regional theatres. Rachel's most recent credits include in theatre, London Assurance at the Irish Rep in New York, for which she won Origin's first Irish Theatre Festival Best Actress Award. And Tello and I saw it together and you were stunning. It was a fantastic production. Her film and TV credits include Warner Brothers Wonder Woman, Elementary, Madam Secretary, Grandchester, Midsummer Murders, Holby City and Victoria and Albert. Rachel, we are delighted you're with us today. Thank and you if your parents you. are watching, hello. Hello, <laughs> we hope you're with us. So, Secondly, Colin Ryan. Colin, we thank you for not getting your hair cut. You do a very good <laughs> Oscar lookalike. On Broadway, Colin has appeared in Waiting for Gardot and No Man's Land, and his TV and film appearances include Blue Blood, Shades of Blue, The Tap, Rockaway Moon, The Last Laugh, and The Sonnet Project. Colin is a graduate of the Academy for Classical Acting. Colin, welcome back. Thanks. And finally, Jarlath, finally but not least, Jarlath Conroy. Jarlath is an award-winning actor from Galway, who has appeared numerous times on Broadway and throughout regional theatres in the United States. Jarlath trained at the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art in London and has worked in that city at the Royal Court as well as at the Old Vic, among other distinguished theatres. Jarlath, you are very welcome. Yes. You're off my screen, but I know you're there. Glad to be here. Okay, hello. <laughs> Jarlath first joined us on Programme One when we looked at Oscar's father, William. Both Rachel and Colin first joined us on Programme 3, when we examined Oscar's tour of America and his marriage to the delightful Constance. Colin also joined us last week when we talked about the final and painful years of Oscar's life. So you're all very welcome back and thank you for your continuing support. We really appreciate it. And at this point, and I need to move on a bit, I would like to say a big thank you to Senator David Norris from Dublin, who could not join us in person, but recorded a poignant message regarding Oscar. We have made the link widely available. And if you would like to read it, hear it, please contact us. But at this point, please welcome my co-curator, Matthew Squirt. Matthew, it's hard to believe this is our sixth and final program. Yes, <clears throat> thank you, Christine. Um, and what a journey it's been. I can't believe we're at the end of our sixth episode. Um, to think that this started as just, a, you know, having this on at the library at Quinnipiac and it's kind of blossomed into this beautiful online venue. Um, again, we've learned so much, I think, not only about Oscar, but technology in general. Um, and again, I just want to thank um, not only Turlo, but, but Christine uh, for, for putting this on. She is the host with the most. So thank you. <laughs> Oh, Matthew, thank you. What can I say? Okay, let's return to Oscar. So in the early 1890s, Oscar was at the height of his creativity. His society plays had made him king of the London's, of London's West End. But three very public and very sensational trials in 1895 brought Oscar's world and that of his family to an abrupt end. The trials resulted in two years hard labor in prison followed by three years of restless and ignoble exile, which was only ended by Oscar's death in November, 1900. He was aged 46. The happy prince was dead and the world was a duller place. Did Oscar foresee his own downfall? 
We start with a reading from Rachel, playing the character of Mrs. Erlen in Lady Windermere's Farm. The play reveals how Mrs. Erlen is actually Lady Windermere's mother, who abandoned her 20 years earlier. The play is from 1893, two years before Oscar's trials. In it, we see much that relates to Oscar's own experience. Rachel, could you please read? Believe what you choose about me. I'm not worth a moment's sorrow. But don't spoil your beautiful young life on my account. You don't know what may be in store for you unless you leave this house at once. You don't know what it is to fall into the pit, to be despised, mocked, abandoned, sneered at, to be an outcast, to find the door shut against one, to have to creep in by hideous byways, afraid every moment lest the mask should be stripped from one's face, and all the while to hear the laughter, the horrible laughter of the world, the thing more tragic than all the tears the world has ever shed. You don't know what it is. One pays for one's sins, and then one pays again, and all one's life one pays. You must never know that. As for me, if suffering be an expiation, then at this moment I have expiated all my faults, whatever they may have been. For tonight, you have made a heart in one who had it not. Made it and broken it, but let that pass. I may have wrecked my own life, but I will not let you wreck yours. You, why you're a mere girl. You would be lost. You haven't got the kind of brains that enables a woman to get back. You have neither the wit nor the courage. You couldn't stand dishonor. No, well go back, Lady Windermere to the husband who loves you, whom you love. You have a child, Lady Windermere. Go back to that child who even now in pain or in joy may be calling to you. God gave you that child. He will require from you that you make his life fine, that you watch over him. What answer will you make to God if his life is ruined through you? Back to your house, Lady Windermere. Your husband loves you. He has never swerved for a moment from the love he bears you. But even if he had a thousand loves, you must stay with your child. If he was harsh to you, you must stay with your child. If he ill-treated you, you must stay with your child. If he abandoned you, your place is with your child. Thank you, Rachel, thank you. So Matthew, a few weeks ago, we talked with Professor John Harrington about what makes Oscar's plays of this period so special. What lasting impact do you think Oscar has had on literature? Yeah, the, I think Oscar Wilde's uh, looking back and kind of understanding him, um, you know, as a figure of literature, of, of British literature, Irish literature, um, he kind of falls in what I call the kind of in-between writers, you know, the writers of the 1890s, early 20th century, who kind of sit um, both in kind of a Victorian past, um, but also, you know, looking ahead to a kind of modernist future. Um, and it's to be remembered, you know, that Victoria lives, you know, essentially forever she dies in 1901. She comes to the throne in 1837. Um, but with that, you know, as you get to the 1890s, there's, there's a kind of self-consciousness of, you know, the idea that they are living in a Victorian period. And so with that, you see, and I think Wilde and a lot of other artists like Joseph Conrad, Thomas um, Hitchens, um, a kind of irony that kind of creeps into their work uh, and a kind of, you could say, darkness, um, you know, seen in, in terms of their, their uh, attitudes towards society. 
um, and, you know, the masses in general. Um, and that you kind of pick up on as you move into the kind of modernist aesthetic, which, you know, prided itself as kind of breaking, a, breaking with a past, breaking with the literary past, the historical past, you know, and Ezra Pound starts to, he called, make it new. Uh, you could see, I think, a lot of that in Oscar Wilde's work um, and, and some of his contemporaries. So again, he's very interesting in that he is in some ways, um, you know, has his foot in, in each, each period, um, which again, I think makes him even more fascinating. So. Okay. Thank you, Matthew. So both Oscar and his mother Speranza were part of an Irish cultural revival that was particularly strong in the 1840s and again in the final decades of the 19th century. Speranza, through her salons in Dublin and London, nurtured young Irish writers, including W.B. Yeats and George Bernard Shaw. But how did these contemporaries view the rise and fall of Oscar Wilde? In the next reading, the poet W.B. Yeats recalls his first encounter with Oscar. Jarlath is going to read Yeats's words. Jarlath. My first meeting with Oscar Wilde was an astonishment. I never before heard a man talking with perfect sentences, as if he had written them all overnight with labour, and yet all spontaneous. There was present that night at the poet William Ernest Henley's, by right of propinquity or of accident, a man full of the secret spite of dullness, who interrupted from time to time and always to check or disorder thought and I noticed with what mastery he was foiled and thrown. I noticed, too, that the impression of artificiality that I, that I think all Wilde's listeners have recorded came from the perfect rounding of the sentences and from the deliberation that made it possible. Thank you, Jarlis. So the following quote from George Bernard Shaw is short, but I think it gives some sense of the identity of both men. Colin, could you read it, please? must not be forgotten that though by culture, Wilde was a citizen of all civilized capitals, he was at root a very Irish Irishman, and as such, a foreigner everywhere but in Ireland. Thank you, Colin. And finally, James Joyce. Joyce was born in Dublin in 1882. So he was aged about 13 when Oscar's trials took place. In 1909, he made the following statement about Oscar during a performance of Salome in Italy. And Jarlath will read it, please. Oscar Fingal O'Flaherty Wills Wilde, son of Usheen in Celtic mythology, had been treacherously killed by the hand of his host as he sat at table. Wilde, too, met his death in the flower of his years as he sat at table, crowned with false vine leaves and discussing Plato. His mother's susceptible temperament revived in the young man, and beginning with himself, he resolved to put into practice a theory of beauty that was partly original and partly derived from the books of Pater and Ruskin. He provoked the jeers of the public by proclaiming and practicing a reform in dress and in the appearance of the home. In the tradition of the Irish writers of comedy that runs from the days of Sheridan and Goldsmith to Bernard Shaw, Wilde became, like them, court jester to the English. Whether he was innocent or guilty of the charges brought against him, he undoubtedly was a scapegoat. His greater crime was he had, called, he had caused a scandal in England, and it is well known that the English authorities did everything possible to persuade him to flee before they issued an order for his arrest. An employee of the Ministry of Internal Affairs stated during the trial that in London alone there are more than 20,000 persons under police surveillance, but they remain footloose until they provoke a scandal. Wilde died a Roman Catholic, adding another facet to his public life by the repudiation of his wild doctrine. After having mocked the idols of the marketplace, he bent his knees, sad and repentant, that he had once been the singer of the divinity of joy, and closed the book of his spirit's rebellion with an act of spiritual dedication. His brilliant books, 
sparkling with epigrams, which made him, in the view of some people, the most penetrating speaker of the past century. These are now divided booty. Thank you, Jolliffe. So, Matthew, these three quotes are generally complimentary, but we know that some of the contemporaries of Oscar, their comments were so verbic when describing Oscar and Speranza. Why do you think they were so ambivalent in their praise? Yeah, I, that's a, again a very interesting question, and I think there's uh, more than um, one or a few answers to that. I think on the one level is you know thinking of each of these artists, Yeats, uh, Joyce, and Shaw, as kind of you know modern in their sensibilities. So in one in one instance, they want to you know kind of keep Wild at arm's length and and kind of keep him you know in the past and 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 say how how you know much better they are uh, than him um, and, and what better artists, you know, kind of anxiety of influence, if you will. Um, the other thing I think, um, and this is probably, you know, more contemporary for them is, you know, the, you know, the Oscar Wilde's, uh, you know, homosexuality, which at that point, you know, did have, uh, you know, a, a big effect on how people viewed him. Um, you know, it's, it's forgotten, I think, that in the early 20th century, a lot of his plays were still kept on, but his name did not appear um, as author. Uh, so I think a lot of what they were trying to do is, I think, in some ways to pay an homage to him, but also be, I think, a little, you know, fearful, lest they're, they're too, you know, um, ostentatious in their praise. Um, and they look to, you know, kind of put him on, on, a, on a pedestal because again, homosexuality, um, you know, very much was uh, an anxiety um, that was shared. So you see in Joyce, for instance, you know, reactions against his mother kind of looking back and saying, you know, there was something wrong with Speranza or Lady Wilde that, that in some ways um, made Wilde in, into, you know, um, who he later became, that he was dressed in girls' clothes, et cetera, et cetera. So again, I do think there's a kind of interesting, um, you know, uh, relationship that they have, which again is, is a mixture of, I think, praise, but also um, a very real sense of, of, of detachment. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you, Matthew. So if those men were ambivalent, one man who is unambivalent in his praise of Oscar Wilde is English actor, presenter, public intellectual, and all-round Renaissance man, Stephen Fry. Stephen played Oscar in the 1997 film, Wild. And at this point, it seems a good time to introduce our special guest, Hollywood producer, Peter Samuelson. Peter, I hope you're still with us and you're very welcome. I'm oh, here. You're here, so Peter, you're very welcome. So just a brief introduction. Peter Samuelson is an English-born Hollywood-based producer whose work is grounded in a belief in responsible entertainment. Peter's, Peter has produced two dozen award-winning films and found five impactful charities. He's currently the CEO of Film County Media, which combines his commitment to social justice with his producing passions. And Peter has a very special connection to Oscar. He was a producer of the great film Wild, starring Stephen Fry, Vanessa Redgrave, and Jude Law. So Peter, you are very welcome. And Peter, if I could ask you a question about the film Wild, which I absolutely love. What are the origins of this film? And were you an Oscar fan before you made it? I was. I first uh, got to know Oscar's writings while I was at Cambridge. He was never on the curriculum that was imposed from above, but I somehow started reading and couldn't stop. And I felt that he had one of the biggest brains I had encountered you know, right up there, I think, with Shakespeare or Chaucer or whoever who were on the curriculum. And so that began uh, a, a relationship with Oscar through his writings. Um, it then came about in the middle of the 90s that my brother, my partner, and I um, realized that we had a way of putting the financing together for some very British films. And one of the directions we wanted to go was to try to be advocates for groups that we felt were either misunderstood or discriminated against, groups which we ourselves uh, didn't form a part of. So 
we started with Tom and Viv, which was the story of T.S. Eliot's uh, checkered first ma marriage to Vivian Haigwood. Um, she was a woman considered to be too uppity for polite society uh, in uh, Britain between the wars. Uh, what you did if you were a visible man uh, and uh, you had a wife who was embarrassing you, you couldn't get a divorce because that reflected poorly on you, but you could have her committed to a mental asylum uh, for the rest of her life. And the way that that was done is that three doctors came late at night to your house and asked three mental arithmetic questions. And if all three were not answered correctly, uh, off went your wife to the asylum. Um, and Elliot never visited her and so forth. So we, we kind of got our feet wet with a bit of advocacy filmmaking with Tom and Viv. Uh, it turned out rather well. It won a whole lot of awards. It was commercially successful. And then we decided, uh, neither of us being gay, that it would be a really good thing to try to make a statement for uh, what we didn't call then LGBTQ rights, but we do now. Um, I, I, I've always believed that social justice requires uh, the fight to be fought, not just by the people standing in that corner. You know, one of the powers of the BLM marches is if you look at who those people are marching, they, have, they are of every ethnicity and walk of life and so forth. And that is why I think we may actually, in the United States and elsewhere, be at a real tipping point. So it seemed to us that we, by telling the story of Oscar, um, we would be able to talk about um, homophobia and institutional homophobia and by telling his story, kind of strike a, a blow in a social justice direction. And I still get letters. Every so often there's a letter from someone in, let's say, Tehran in Iran saying, I've, I've, forgive me, I have a bootleg DVD and I've watched your film, you know, 50 times and it gives me comfort because I'm a homosexual and, you know, they kill us here in Iran and so on and so forth. I think it's shocking um, that the prejudice that Oscar felt, uh, while we may have made a bit of progress, not enough, but a bit in, you know, the United Kingdom, Ireland, the United States, etc. There are so many parts of the world mm. where basically they may not have a treadmill, they, you know, hang you or flog you or, you know, the guy who owns the Dorchester, the Sultan of Brunei, um, announced, you know, death to homosexuals. And then he realized people weren't going to stay at the Dorchester anymore. Uh, there was a boycott led by George Clooney. So they rolled that back and said they would only flog them instead of killing them. And, you know, M Malawi, um, Tanzania, Uganda, uh, so Saudi Arabia, not good places to be a, uh, recognized as gay. So I think the story is of now and it has the power of, you know, the great Oscar as the protagonist. Okay. Um, so Stephen Wilde, sorry, Stephen Wilde, he's Stephen Fry played Wilde and just did so with such panache, empathy and compassion. Do you think anybody else could have played it the way Stephen did? Well, we were under pressure from the money that they wanted, you know, somebody else with a, a bigger name. Stephen back then in 95, 96, when we were putting the film together, really didn't have much of a name. Um, he, his, his professional career, I think, was in a way launched by Wilde. Um, we never really seriously considered anyone else. And we flirted with not being able to finance the film, but we stuck with Stephen. Uh, it was not a cakewalk. Um, he, Stephen has fought with demons of mental illness his whole life. And two weeks before principal photography on Wild, he was the lead in a Shaftesbury Avenue play called Cellmates, 
and he simply didn't show up for curtain uh, one evening and um, could not be found. And people thought perhaps he had committed suicide and was having what Churchill called his black dog moment. Uh, and um, we didn't know what to do. And then miraculously a week later, um, he simply showed up sheepishly and said, I'm very sorry, I had a bad week and here I am and can we make the film? Um, he had actually, because he's Stephen, um, he had decided to have his breakdown while taking pictures of stained glass windows in the great cathedrals of France. So he had got in his little car and had been driving around France taking those pictures. The problem was we couldn't get him insured because the insurance company said, well, how do we know he'll show up for eight weeks? So in the end, he, Stephen had to put up his fees against his punctuality and that wasn't enough. So actually my brother and I put our fees up as well, but somehow or other we ended up making the film. Um, and I think it's one of the great performances. I think he actually is the reincarnation of Oscar uh, and, and off camera, I, I mean, he's that smart. He's, he's an extraordinary man just to sit with at dinner because Stephen knows everything about it. I mean, he's literally a polymath and a great, you know, privilege. You, you, you feel when you're with him that you're sitting with a great man, a great person. And um, he obviously knew everything about Oscar. Um, you know, he could have written the book. I mean, actually we based the film on the Elman uh, biography, which we bought, um, which seemed to be the definitive one, Richard Elman. Um, and then we had a great writer um, in Julian Mitchell. And, um, you know, Steve, I, I don't know how many, raise your hand if you've actually seen the film. All right, well, th those deprived souls who haven't seen it, um, uh, it's available and you watch it online. And uh, uh, I think Stephen Fry did us proud. He did. And I know I follow Stephen Fry. You can tell I'm a fan. Um, I know when Stephen recently got married, the witness at his wedding was a stuffed doll of Oscar. So you know, that's true <laughs> devotion for you. Um, we have a quote from Stephen, which suggests one way of understanding Oscar. As we've discussed over the last six weeks, there are many ways of understanding Oscar. But Peter, would you mind reading the quote from Stephen, please? Yes, it's actually a quote within a quote. So the, the, these begin as Stephen's words, but then uh, at the quote marks, they are Oscar's words. Oscar Wilde said, quote, that if you know what you want to be, then you inevitably become it. That is your punishment. But if you never know, then you can be anything, unquote. There is a truth to that. We're not nouns, we're, we're verbs. I am not a thing, an actor, a writer, I'm a person who does things. I write, I act, and I never know what I'm going to do next. I think you can be imprisoned if you think of yourself as a noun. Okay, very um, Stephen and very Oscar. And I think what combines the two is their intellectualism, which they both wear very lightly. And also I would say their kindness. Um, I've never met Stephen, but I get the sense he's very kind. So return to the film. The rest of the cast was also perfect. Vanessa Redgrave played my beloved Speranza. Jude Law played Bosie. How did they prepare for these roles? Well, we all read The Elman, for sure. Uh, it was actually, believe it or not, um, Jude Law's first role of any significance in a motion picture. And casting the role of Bosie seemed to us incredibly important because we're very much aware that if the film was any good at all, its audience would be of any sexual preference. And actually, truth be told, most of the people watching the film would not be gay. Um, and here was a man, Oscar Wilde, who was married with two children and who was so smitten in a moment by Bosie 
that he abandoned his marriage and went off with Bosie. So we said, well, we probably should, should choose someone where even the heterosexual men in the audience of the film would say, oh my God, well, of course he had to, you know, go with his feelings there. So Jude Law is not only the most magnificent Adonis-like specimen of, of male humanity you can possibly imagine, but we took forever. The first time you see him in the film, uh, we shot in the Cafe Royal, which is where they actually, I, I believe, met. Um, I remember we decided we had done a really stupid thing because the Cafe Royal, all the walls are made of mirror and we had a devil of a job hiding the camera crew in the lights. Um, but we spent a long time, a whole morning, lighting Jude's close up because he had to look godlike in order to make um, Oscar's motivation work. And I, I, I think we pulled it off and more importantly, Jude did. Um, Vanessa Redgrave is obviously one of our great actresses of a certain age. Um, and she's also a, um, uh, knows a great deal about Oscar. We made her an offer, she said yes. Um, she did try and proselytize for her political causes, pretty much the whole crew. We had, you know, the drivers saying, I don't know what she was talking about, but I smiled. Um, <laughs> So she certainly has a political agenda, and um, but she is a great Speranza for sure. Got nailed the accent. I hope you Irish folks on the call um, agree. Yeah, they were they were just perfect. So Peter, you also are very involved in philanthropic work. Would you perhaps briefly tell us about some of the work you do outside the studio, please? Well, I'm 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 delighted um, to be a bit surrounded here by people that I work with in one of my philanthropies, which is called First Star, where what we do is we take looked after children, if you're uh, in Ireland or the UK, or if you're in Canada, they're Crown Wards, or if you're in a, the United States, they're called Foster Kids. But we house, educate and encourage high school aged, um, you know, years nine through 12, uh, young people, boys and girls, with the singular goal of getting them into university out of school. Because although 45% um, of American 12th graders, uh, in fact, go to college and university, uh, it's less than 9%. And in the UK, the numbers are even worse. Um, so uh, um, I also could mention that uh, we've, doc we've got Dr. Um, Kathleen Reardon, who um, co-invented the First Star Academies with me a number of years ago, who is on this line with us. And she is Irish, and she's connected, I think, from somewhere near Cork. And then we've got Dr. Lorna Goodwin. I try and surround myself with PhDs. Um, <laughs> and Lorna is the executive director of First Star in the UK. And also on with us is Aidan Wellen, who is in Dublin. And the three of us, the four of us, are collaborating on trying to bring First Star's program to a university or universities in the country, Ireland. And whether we'll pull that off, we don't know. It's not helped by the COVID for the time being. But so, yes, I mean, I, I, the skill set of starting a nonprofit, a charity, is not a million miles from getting... Uh, a, a film off the ground. First of all, it helps if you're a little bit raving mad uh, to think that you might actually do it. Uh, you have to know how to create the business plan, understand whether um, it's sort of worthy of devoting a chunk of your life to it. Is it going to work? Will it be any good? Where's the money going to come from? Who's going to help? Who shall we partner with? And with those people I just mentioned, we've really um, we, we, we have 17 academies in um, between the UK and the United States, uh, soon to be 19 if the COVID would end. And um, it goes from strength to strength. You heard me say less than 9% of these unfortunate children go to university. Our conversion rate is actually average of the last three years, 89%. So we're exactly 10x the, uh, the, the benchmark. So... Um, 
and I'm so grateful for a bit of um, <coughs> moral support from my colleagues in First Star coming on this call. Now you'll have to read more Oscar Wilde. <laughs> so thank you, Peter, and you. I just wish you every success. <coughs> great, great project. So uh, Drs. Aredon, Dr. Goodwin, and you're very welcome. And Aidan, we've communicated about Frederick Douglass, another great social activist. So. Um, I'm delighted you're with us today, Aidan. So just briefly, mm -hmm. and final question for now, Peter, 120 years after Oscar's death, what does Oscar mean to you? Well, I, I'm very much aware that the world is an unjust place and that we have a lot of work to do. Um, you know, it's not that many years since Stonewall in the United States. Uh, I remember Julian Mitchell, um, who, who, who is gay and who wrote our um, screenplay, I remember at a dinner while we were making the film, and remember this was 1996, I guess, um, I remember Julian saying, I, I asked a question like how, in this day and age, how does being gay impact your life? He said, well, you know, I'm a, of a certain age. I've been uh, with my partner, um, faithfully and monogamously for 38 years or something of that sort and he said and we just recently were focused on the fact when the when the first of us dies um, because we're not allowed to be married um, and so there won't be any tax-free right of inheritance uh, whoever survives will have to sell the house in order to pay the death duties and I thought, my goodness, yes, of course. And I think we're still surrounded. I know that little one or big one uh, has been sorted out, but not in so many different parts of the world. I think it is still a very difficult, marginalized community, as are so many of others. And I, I really do believe we have to step outside our own corner and fight for everyone else's corners. So I'm working on a film at the moment that has to do with, if you can believe this, it's a sort of um, quadratic storyline. It's about a group of filmmakers going to Connecticut to make a film about a shooting uh, of a um, African-American victim by a Caucasian police officer. And he, the, the, the policeman, um, after he was found guilty, killed himself. So it's actually a tragedy of two families. And the diversity of voices on the film crew, who are played by actors in the overarching film, um, g g gives one the opportunity to have all sorts of opinions, good, bad, and indifferent there. Why did you have to make it in our town? We'd only just gotten over the actual murder. Why leave us all alone? You know, we're all getting on fine now. Why do you have to focus a light, a light on this? So um, one of the things that I was looking at the other night is the, at that uh, iconic photograph of Dr. King as he's about to lead hundreds of marchers down off the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma into the billy clubs of Bull Connor with all their helmets on and some of them on horses, all very, very scary. And with the newsreel cameras of the world and the New York Times journalists and so forth actually standing there watching it as though it's a spectator sport. And um, if you look carefully at the picture of Dr. King, there was every ethnicity and every religious belief. He, and you can tell you know, he's, he, he actually sent a telegram out um, about a week earlier and said, we're having a spot of bother here and I could use your support. And he sent it to every co-religionist of every denomination of everything, you know, Muslims and Jews and all the different varieties of Christians. And a lot of them came, you know, on the train uh, and, um, they all marched together with their arms linked down into the billy clubs. I think when we stand together for human rights, uh, we have the right to expect success. 
And if we all only fight our own corner, I think we are the weaker for it. <clears throat> so black lives do matter, but we all need to march for them, etc. <clears throat> Okay, thank you. We'll leave it there for now, but I hope you'll stay with us in case we have questions for you. So one thing we've asked all of our guests over the last few weeks is what does Oscar mean to them? And we thought we'd end this program by actually asking the three presenters, Matthew, Turlo and myself, to very briefly explain what Oscar means to you. So can we start with Matthew? Matthew, what does Oscar mean to you and has this changed over the years? Yes, um, so Oscar is... Um, Amongst many things, I, I'm just in love with him as a writer um, and his kind of command of language. Now, I started, you know, reading Oscar Wilde in college. Um, when I went to grad school, I actually took one of Christine's classes on Oscar. Um, and, and really, it was that um, kind of critical realignment and kind of going back and actually looking at Wilde, not only in terms of just his works, but his life and um, as, as we've heard, the Richard Elman biography was very important um, to me. I think it's a wonderful biography still. Um, but really, again, what I go back to, um, not so much as just his life, because I think, again, sometimes his life tends to outweigh um, or outshine at least his, his work. Um, but really his work, you know, and his criticism in particular, the critic as artist, you know, the decay of lying, things like that. Um, things that I continue to go back to over and over again. I'm just overwhelmed by the paradox and, and the kind of performance um, of him and his life. Um, and, and it's just, it's wonderful. Um, and so I'm very um, you know, honored uh, that, that I get to partake in something like this that gets to give you the audience. And I think us, you know, as presenters, uh, so much a kind of bountiful feast um, of Oscar Wilde. So I'll, I'll okay, put it Matthew. there because I know we have a little time. <laughs> okay, thank you, Matthew. So Turlo, our friend from Donegal, what does Oscar mean to you? Well, I, you know, these days, uh, just picking up what uh, Peter is saying, in a day where monuments are all being reviewed across the country, across the United States, I started thinking about what kind of monuments were out there to Oscar. And, uh, I, you know, I made a sort of a very brief list. Uh, the monuments to Oscar that are around today are his, his home of his, his birthplace was on Westland Row in Dublin, which backs up to Trinity College. And, uh, and that's a pretty good place for him to be connected to because they have established at Trinity the Oscar Wilde Center uh, where they give out the Rooney Prize for Irish Literature every year. So that was one of the other, the other uh, memorial that comes immediately to mind is his actual home on Marion Square, uh, number one Marion Square, the most fashionable square in Dublin. His neighbors would have been uh, later, would have been uh, W.B. Yeats. And as Christine and I both know, know well, Daniel O'Connell lived across the other side of the square. But on the square today is his home is now occupied by the American College Dublin. And there's a, a memorial right in front, a sculpture of Oscar reclining on this huge boulder. And in front of him, as you can see in the slide, there are two smaller images. One is of Constance and the other is of Dionysius, the god of drama and wine. So the other, the other monument, of course, that struck me as being kind of very significant uh, is, and if we can go to the next slide, is in, uh, are both in London and in Paris. Mm -hmm. The one in London was put together by a bunch of actors, prominent actors, Judy Dench, poets, Seamus Heaney, and others uh, near Trafalgar Square. And it does this wonderful image of Oscar, and it has the great quote on it. Um, uh, we're all in the gutter now, but some of us are looking at the stars. And then, of course, the other one is the sensational one in Paris, which is his grave, his tombstone. And uh, there, the epitaph there is from Reading Jail. And I'm delighted to say that the Irish government uh, have the job of keeping that up to date and keeping it clean because next to the Jim Morrissey in the, in the Pierre, Pierre Lachaise uh, graveyard is constantly got lipstick and what have you on it. So they do a very jo a good job of keeping it fresh and clean. Uh, the last one that I, I'd like to mention is a, a different kind of monument. And this is the work of Marilyn Holland, who is Oscar's grandson, a wonderful man. I'm, I'm, I'm sure he, uh, certainly a consultant to Elman and to the latest biographer, 
um, Matthew Sergis. And Merlin, I met him a few years ago, and he is the real keeper of his grandfather's flame. Uh, he has the, the name Constance gave to the family when they were fleeing the disgrace in Europe. They adopted her, one of her family names, Holland, and they kept that name right through. But Marilyn's work, I won't spend too much, but I, th I would like to just read one quote that uh, we came across uh, from Marilyn that really speaks not only to his work uh, on keeping his grandfather's reputation going, but also just what it means to him personally. And he has done monumental work in terms of uh, putting together books on letters from the wilds, from both his grandmother, Constance, and of course, Oscar. But here's what, here's what Marilyn said, talking about his own role in life. He said, I've never wanted to go to conferences and simply be treated as a living descendant of the person being studied. I would find that deeply disturbing. This monkey in a cage, throw him in a handful of peanuts. What's he going to do? Do you look like him? Are you capable of turning words in his way? Can you be humorous? People come up to you at a book signing and say, can you write something funny? A greater killer than that you can't imagine. I suppose what I wanted at some stage was an acceptance of the fact that what I was doing had value. There was an awful thought at the back of my mind that it's the emperor's new clothes, but dismiss it. One has to remind oneself that, as he said, he roused the imagination of the century. He is a bridge between the Victorian world and our own. And people always think he lived more recently than he did. By the start of the 1990s, people thought he had died, and that he, that he had died in the 1920s and was a contemporary of Noel Coward. There's an element of wanting to have him in the 20th century, the 21st century, our century, because of his vibrant modernity. And those are the words of his grandson, Marilyn Holland. Thank you. Okay, so I think it's me just to say um, how I see Oscar and I see Oscar through multiple lenses. Um, I came to him through his mother, the wonderful Speranza, my own research is on the 1840s. So I see him as Speranza's son. I see him as a major intellectual and I see him as being Irish. And that was the whole thrust of this um, exhibition initially, Oscar and the importance of being Irish. So I was at Trinity in the 1980s. And at that time, as we discussed last week, homosexuality was illegal. There was no Oscar Wilde Center. He was not taught, he was not mentioned. So in my own lifetime, I've seen a great transformation. And one of the academics, a Trinity person, who really uncovered that history is Declan Kybird. And this is something he wrote in 1995, which is the start of that intellectual recovery. So Jarlith, could you read Declan Kybird, please? And can I just say, he starts it off with a quote from Oscar. Oscar who said, I am Irish by race but the English have condemned me to speak the language of Shakespeare. So, Jarlath, if you could read Declan Kyber, please. Wilde's entire literary career represented an ironic comment on the tendency of Victorian Englishmen to attribute to the Irish those emotions which they had repressed within themselves. His essays on Ireland question the assumption that just because the English are one thing, the Irish must be its opposite. With his sharp intelligence, Wilde saw that the image of the stage Irishman tells us far more about English fears than Irish realities. Yeats saw Wilde's snobbery as the clever strategy of an Irishman marooned in London, whose only weapon against Anglo-Saxon prejudice was to become more English than the English themselves thereby challenging many time-honored myths about the Irish. So, thank you. And I just have two thoughts on Oscar, because again, he seems to, every generation seems to discover him and love him. And uh, just very quickly, um, Winston Churchill, the epitome of the British Bulldog, he was once asked if he was reincarnated, who would he like to come back as? And of course he chose Oscar Wilde. And then I had the privilege to live in Liverpool. And if any of you are old enough to remember the 1967 groundbreaking album, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Heart Club Band, who is standing at John Lennon's right shoulder? Of course, it's Oscar. So clearly Oscar continues to intrigue, inform, charm and challenge generation 
after generation. Mm -hmm. And at this point, Tolo, do we have any very quick questions? Yeah, one good question from Jeff. Uh, for you, Peter, did you discover anything about Oscar that surprised you when you were working on the, the movie? Oh, Peter needs to be unmuted. Okay, I'm going to unmute. Okay, there you go, Peter. There we go. Um, I did, and it was thanks to you. Uh, I had never read, never come across the letter that he wrote to the editor of a British newspaper about the plight of British children incarcerated in British adult prisons. And it brought two of my worlds together because, of course, one of the things that we deal with in First Star is the ongoing propensity of the American legal and judicial system to send um, 14 year olds to adult prison where they are further criminalized um, and then released with um, greatly diminished lives. And that still goes on today. So um, I, I love the fact that my Oscar um, had those feelings of moral outrage, which were completely appropriate back then. Okay, thank you. So tell her one more quick one, maybe? Yeah, well, we have one, uh, Christine. I think, um, were you surprised at Oscar's deathbed conversion to Catholicism? No, um, throughout his life, he'd flirted with Catholicism and he was somebody who loved spectacle. Um, but I think he liked the sensuality of the old traditional Catholic church, the spectacle of it. And I think then, you know, at these final desperate years of his life, he sort of reconnected with that spirituality. So in some ways it was almost inevitable, but given Ireland, the whole Protestant ascendancy, snobbery, I think it would have been difficult for him to do so earlier, but I think it was almost logical. So we're going to move on at this point. I apologize, but we're running out of time. Um, so for the final reading in this series, we return to the words of Oscar. It is from De, De Profundus, one of his final pieces of literature written from Reading Jail to Lord Alfred Douglas in 1897. It captures Oscar's own evolution as a man and as an artist. And Colin, could you read this for us, please? For yourself, I have but this last thing to say. Do not be afraid of the past. If people tell you that it is irrevocable, do not believe them. The past, the present, and the future are but one moment in the sight of God, in whose sight we should try to live. Time and space, succession and extension, are merely accidental conditions of thought. The imagination can transcend them and move in a free sphere of ideal existences. Things also are, in their essence, what we choose to make them. A thing is according to the mode in which one looks at it. Where others, says Blake, see but the dawn coming over the hill, I see the sons of God shouting for joy. What seemed to the world and to myself, my future, I lost, irretrievable when I let myself be taunted into taking the action against your father. I dare say I lost it in reality long before that. What lies before me is my past. I have got to make myself look on that with different eyes, to make the world look on it with different eyes, to make God look on it with different eyes. This I cannot do by ignoring it or slighting it or praising it or denying it. It is only to be done fully by accepting it as an inevitable part of the evolution of my life and character by bowing my head to everything that I have suffered. How far, away, how far I am away from the true tempter of soul, this letter in its changing uncertain moods, its scorn and bitterness, its aspirations and its failures to realize those aspirations, shows you quite clearly. But do not forget in what a terrible school I am sitting at my task. 
and incomplete, imperfect as I am. Yet from me you may have still much to gain. You came to me to learn the pleasure of life and the pleasure of art. Perhaps I am chosen to teach you something much more wonderful, the meaning of sorrow and its beauty. Thank you, Colin. And I just to return to Peter's point earlier, would Oscar have imagined that 123 years later we'd be listening to his words and they'd be moving us so much? So we have to conclude. Oscar, scholar, literary genius, feminist, humanist, Irish nationalist, gay icon, cultural icon, a loving son, brother, husband, father, who was kind, compassionate and funny, a man who transcended boundaries and who was punished for doing so. It was a tragic ending to a short life. But we want to end these series by toasting Oscar with a specially created cocktail, Born to be Wild. But before we do that, there are many, many people to thank. So thank you to all of our brilliant readers and especially to those who joined us today, Colin Ryan, Rachel Pickup and Jarlath Conroy. Thank you so much for being part of that Oscar family. To all of our special guests, but especially Peter Samuelson for such wonderful, wonderful insights. Thank you so much. Thank you to Senator David Norris for Zooming in from Dublin. Thank you to today's audience and to everybody who has joined us virtually over the last six weeks. We really appreciate it. And of course, extra special thanks to my partners in this uncharted adventure. My co-curator, Matthew Squirt, and our producer, Taylor McConnell. It has been a pleasure to work with you both. What will I do with my Wednesdays? I'm thinking I may have to make banana bread. Who knows? And thank you to everybody who has given us support. But the final and biggest thanks belong to Oscar Wilde. So as I run through the people to find, and if I can end, and this is something I made earlier, as they used to say, final thanks to Oscar Wilde. Join me in raising the toast to thank Oscar for letting us look at the stars and to dream of better days ahead. To Oscar. 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 Thank you, Slancha.